Thank you, Nancy. First Peter is sometime middle, uh, maybe even later, of the second century. It reflects a church a lot more organized than, for sure, the letters of Paul indicate as he's founding churches or as the Gospels are written and based in communities of faith. And it introduces some concepts that took a while to get going, some of which kind of haunt us to this day. Uh, medieval theologians made a lot of it, Protestants pretty well threw it out, but where it talks about Jesus going to preach to the spirits that are in prison, that's what's often called the harrowing of hell. Uh, and it means that Jesus went down to hell to talk to the condemned and spring those who had faith out. That kind of goes against the idea of, you know, it's either up or down, and that's that. And it's really not based on a concept of what we've come to know popularly as hell, but the idea of going to the land of the dead, which is a much more common Old Testament concept, and that he went to people back in the past and brought them out. I'm not sure Jesus, the time traveler, is part of the gospel. But you're free to doubt either way if you wish. I mean, that's part of the nice thing of doing Bible study, right? But it also reflects that this is a much more organized church where people are telling other people how to cope. And I still like the one part it says, though, isn't it better to be in trouble for doing good than to be in trouble for doing bad? I mean, at least if you're in trouble for doing good, you know you did something good, right? It's okay to say, it's all right that no good deed goes unpunished. As long as I did a good deed. But, you know, if I did a bad deed, hey, guess what? I deserved what I got, right? So, it's kind of this practical guide to Christian living in the second century as they're getting numerous, but kind of persecuted in some places, but getting organized and kind of starting to give instructions, which is a different kind of thing than we find even in John, the last gospel written. These are by communities that are somewhere between 40 years to 60 years after the resurrection. These are folks that are gathered still probably based either in the Holy Land and Galilee or maybe in Antioch in the case of the writer of Luke. But what we have is a much more direct line to the words of Jesus without so much explanation. So if you want to turn with me to John 14, 15 on page 95 of your pew Bible. The nice part about these Bibles is they're thin. It also means it's fun trying to flip the pages. This continues where we were about God's house has many rooms. And this is from that great chapter of comfort, John 14. Again, as I said during the children's the children's youth time, these are statements that Jesus is making and this is right before I am the true vine and right after no one comes to the Father except through me. And Philip says, Lord, show us the Father and we'll be satisfied. Nobody's ever seen God. Don't you know that, Philip? So Jesus takes them through that. Then he talks about his relationship with the disciples and how this works in his relationship to the Father and how this works with our relationship with God. Now I have heard this quoted by controlling parents, this opening, and it's based on a different basis than they think, I think. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. 
But the opposite is not true, parent to child. If you don't keep my commandments, you don't love me. And I've known parents who use that as a whip on children. But this is the positive side of it. This is, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth that the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you and he will be in you. I also need to give you a brief word here for the gender conscious. Holy Spirit in Greek doesn't have gender. But Holy Spirit is a person without a specific gender. English doesn't have that. So when it says he, 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 he all the time, that's not what the Greek says. What the Greek says is person, 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 person. The person, the spirit. The person, the spirit. The person, the spirit. And it's one of the tricks of translating into English that it comes out a lot more patriarchal than even the Old Testament was intended because we don't have a pronoun for folks without specifying gender. So, the spirit. The world cannot see the spirit or know the spirit, but we know the spirit. You know him because the spirit abides with you and the spirit will be in you. That's our relationship with the spirit of God. And in my understanding, it doesn't have to be yours. I'm really much more concerned that I model the Holy Spirit's action on the words, teaching, life, and ministry of Jesus, and I regard the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of Jesus set loose in the world. So that we're going to do Ascension Sunday next week where he's taken from their sight. Does that mean that Jesus is on the top of a three-story universe living up in heaven with God and not down here on earth? That was part of why this doctrine of the Spirit was there. That's also why these words are a teaching given from Jesus, because it ties together with what's going to happen next. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world no longer will see me, but you will see me, because I live, you also will live. Now, that can have a couple different sets of applications. One of which is, I will take you beyond this life into the life to come. Because I live, you also will live. It can also be, and you want to be aware of this as we get ready for the next verse, that it could be he's talking right about the events right then and there, the events leading up to the arrest, trial, crucifixion, and resurrection. It could be that he's saying this is going to happen in the next couple weeks. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live, you also will live. On that day, is that the day of our Dying and knowing that our promise was true? Or is it on that day when the disciples saw him Easter evening? On that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. And that's the level of the relationship. It's a love that ties God the Father, Jesus, and us. <coughs> they who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me. And those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. Now, why would he need to say that if he was talking just to the disciples right then and there? This gospel was written beyond <coughs> the resurrection, as I said, two generations later. This is written in the gospel, in the words of Jesus, for those of us who come later. 
that he wants to be a part of our lives. Those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. It is entirely possible to be a living Christian, not a remote control Christian. You ever known those remote control airplanes that I always used to watch crash at the local airport? It wasn't so bad when they were only two foot wide, but I remember one guy that had a 10 foot wingspan, balsa wood, four engine prop bomber. And man, when that thing crashed, there were splinters everywhere. The remote control failed. The plane was in good shape, but the controller was messed up. Sometimes we think rather than experience directly the power and passion of Jesus in our lives directly, we want to kind of keep him at arm's length and kind of use the church as a filter, you know, to only let certain parts of Jesus in. When instead, what he intended this fellowship to be was a place where we all become more and more and more alive in him. And we get more and more awake, more and more alert, more and more powerful to do what he wants us to do. Now, Judas, not Judas the Iscariot, the other Judas, the disciple, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will reveal yourself to us and not to the world? Well, there's two, again, two things back right then and then later and now. First of all, why aren't you going to show these Romans who you are? Why aren't you going to go into the temple in your resurrected power and whomp on those people and get rid of them and put us in their place? That's the first question. The second question is for later. Why, if Jesus is resurrected from the dead, why is it just left to us to tell the story and he didn't do anything in history to prove he was right. Why did he trust it to us? How many of you are really good at public relations and publicity? Maybe two, maybe three, okay. Have you ever thought of Jesus' resurrection as a hard sell? Yeah. yeah. It's one of those things that you have to to find somebody who lives it, somebody who experienced him, somebody who knows him currently. And then you start to ask the questions that lead to belief. Jesus answered Judas, those who love me will keep my word and my father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. Wow, whoever loves me, I will come and make my home with them. What words? What words? Wow. But do you want God at your house? Are you doing stuff at your house, on your telephone, in your letter writing, with your investments that you just assumed Jesus didn't know about? That's why a lot of people like religion, but they're not sure they like faith. You know, religion, they can show up and do the number, but when it comes to living faith, that's scary because Jesus is here. And that's the point of this passage. If we love him, we will keep his commandments, not because we have to, to get something from him, because he's already given us life itself. Now, and forever but instead because we love him we want to do what he wants done we want to be part of his will his action in the world and we want to say Lord let me help Lord let me follow Lord let me by my actions by what I do and what I don't do show my love for you amen our hymn, Spirit of the Living God, Fall Fresh on Me, 280.